Hello, Speaker Series. My name is Chris Ross. I am president of the local chapter of Wild Montana. And on behalf of Wild Montana, the uh, Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation and the Lookout Association, uh, we want to welcome you and thanks for, for coming tonight. It's always a great series. I love the fact that typically we always have to set up a carriage. So uh, <laughs> tell your friends and neighbors about the next one next month as well. Um, I'm sure that will be excellent as well. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items tonight. Um, there's going to be some wild Montana folks handing out clipboards tonight. The, uh, the Lookout Association has uh, events. They don't sell out. They, they fill out uh, very, very quickly. Bob Marshall has outings, and they fill up very quickly. And so there's a lot of stuff that people like to do, and we want to take advantage of that and provide some opportunities for our, our members as well. But you do not have to be a Wild Montana member to join us on some our adventures this summer. So we do have some trail work we're going to be doing. We've uh, created an adopt a trail program on the Cali Mountain Trail. We have two dates we're going to be working on the trail. This is a uh, trail work. So we're going to be carrying tools and, and digging trenches and things like that. So if that's something you're interested in volunteering, we'd love to have you. That's going to be May 4th is one date and the second date is June 29th. It's really hard to see on the clipboard, but if you're interested in that, just note that you're interested in the Cali Lake trail work. The second thing we're doing is we've um, worked with the uh, Jewel Basin folks, National Forest Service, and we created an ambassador program where we're going to have a presence up there at the uh, Camp Misery Trailhead. Been there a million times, couldn't remember it. Um, so we're going to be talking about things with visitors about leave no trace and um, things to watch out for wildlife wise and we'll of course be promoting wild Montana and public lands things. If you're the kind of person that likes to meet and greet folks in a parking lot at a trailhead and talk about the joys of hiking and what wildlife people might see or what flowers they might see, if that's something that appeals to you, please sign up for that. There's going to be several dates in July and August. We're happy to have all kinds of volunteers um, with us for that. If you have any questions, just look for us, Wild Montana folks. We've got the badges on tonight. And don't forget to visit with the um, Lookout Association folks if you have questions, and the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation. And Mountain Fest film that Bob Marshall puts on is airing tomorrow, tomorrow night. I know I have tickets, so woohoo. Um, all right, tonight, <laughs> I've, I've heard Tim speak before. He's awesome. Uh, he's a lot of fun. And of course, bears. bears. Everybody loves bears, right? So. Uh, brief introduction on, on Tim. He's kind of been the man, the bear man in, the, in this area for, for a long, long time. He was with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, a biologist and bear specialist for 37 years. Mm -hmm. And he's a Montana boy, grew up in the Great Falls area. Um, and uh, he's got some great, great videos and stories. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's welcome Tim. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, in the back? They wanted to make sure that you could hear me back there okay. So, well, thank you. Uh, sure appreciate everybody coming tonight. And it looks like we have pretty much a full house and they gave me an hour to talk and I'll try to keep it shorter than two hours. <laughs> um, once I get going on bears, it's pretty easy to keep going, but I, I've been practicing and trying to make sure that I keep it to a reasonable amount of time tonight. And uh, I sure appreciate everybody showing up tonight and uh, hopefully we'll have time for questions afterwards. If people uh, have things they wanna talk about or ask questions to me uh, for me about, uh, feel free to do that. So what we're gonna do tonight is talk about grizzly bears and I'm gonna concentrate on grizzly bears in Northwest Montana. And um, that's the area that I've worked in for the last 37 plus years. And uh, I see a lot of familiar faces out here. A lot of bear biologists are sitting in the audience. <laughs> and a lot of people whose houses I've been to because they've had bears in their houses. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and, and start and I'm gonna do it a little bit different. I kind of wanna give a little bit of history, but also talk about um, you know, some of the new technology, new techniques and uh, that have been developed over the years that I've seen 
in terms of uh, grizzly bear research and also grizzly bear management. So as you know, uh, Chris said, I'm retired. I retired from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. My wife, Rachel, also retired. And so people say, what do you do when you're retired? Well, we went to the Virgin Islands and the year after we retired, spent a month there. And then last year, we went up to Alaska and spent seven weeks up in Alaska. But I know you guys aren't here to talk about what I did during retirement, so we're gonna talk about bears. I can't uh, talk really about bears in Northwest Montana without talking a little bit about Dr. Chuck Jonkel. And I know several of the people in here have worked with Chuck, were students under Chuck, and he did a lot uh, for bear research in Northwest Montana and throughout Montana, and there's some familiar faces. He had an 80th birthday party up at Saunderson Meadow, and Chuck has since been deceased, but um, it was a great get together, and uh, like I said, a lot of people in here uh, are students of Chuck, and uh, he basically led a lot of the research and developed the biologists uh, that are working in Montana on grizzly bears and throughout the world. I'm not gonna go into the grizzly bear research projects per se, but I did wanna mention them because they're really important. I started working in the cabinet yak with Wayne Kayswurm and Tim Thier and Harry Carillis, a few other folks back in 1984. Um, that project's still ongoing and uh, uh, Wayne now works for the Fish and Wildlife Service. South Fork of the Flathead Grizzly Bear Project, Rick Mace headed that up. Um, and I worked with Rick and Keith Oni on that, um, and Rick retired, uh, and that project is over with. The Greater Glacier DNA Project, Kate Kendall, um, she's now retired, Kate's here, and she started that, and then also the NCD DNA Project, Kate started that, and that actually gave us a population estimate for grizzly bears, first time ever uh, in Montana, in Northwest Montana for the NCDE. And then um, Tabitha Graves um, took over Kate's position after Kate retired, and she did work on grizzly bears and huckleberries, and she's into bumblebees and all other kinds of stuff, sheep and goats and stuff now. And she works with the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, primarily in Glacier Park. And then the NCD Population Trend Project, Rick May started that. It was an interagency project. Rick retired, and Cecily Costello and Lori Roberts are basically working on that, and I see Lori's here tonight also. So that was the research, and then there's the grizzly bear management specialist position, and that's what I was uh, mainly hired for. And um, the Fish, Wildlife, and Park folks, Kim Annis was out of uh, Libby, she resigned, Garrett Tovey's doing that now. Of course, I uh, was in Region 1, Flathead area, retired Justine Valiers, she took over my position, Justine's here tonight. Uh, you'll see a lot of pictures of Justine in the presentation. Eric Wenham, you probably heard Eric's name. He did Black Bear Mountain Lion work, but he's also uh, been very involved with grizzlies, and he's doing the grizzly bear stuff also. Jamie Jonkel, Chuck's son, is down out of Region 2, south end of the NCDE, uh, Missoula area. And then Mike Madel was the other bear specialist. Uh, he was the first one that was actually hired prior to me being hired, and he was out of Shodo. And, Mike retired, and he's been uh, replaced uh, by Chad White, who used to work with Eric Wenham, and Wesley Sarmento. They're based out of Shoto and Valier on the front. And then the Blackfeet tribe, Dan Carney, he's retired. Brandon Kitson took that position on the Blackfeet Nation, did bear management. Stacy Corville, he passed away. Uh, Peyton Adams uh, for the Confederated Saley Scrutiny Tribe. John Waller uh, from Glacier National Park, Heads up a lot of the bear management in the park. And then uh, Ted North and Chrissy Lambert, they're with Wildlife Services and they deal with, uh, Ted responds to livestock depredation and Chrissy is with Wildlife Services and does a lot of preventative stuff. So that's kind of an overview of the folks that are involved. I'm not gonna go into any big detail in terms of them, but I wanted to let you know, I'm not the only one that deals with grizzly bears. <laughs> There's a lot of other biologists and people and technicians that I haven't even mentioned that are involved with bear management. So grizzly bears, they basically live by their nose. 
that's a close up of a grizzly bear nose. The picture next to it on the bottom, that's the reason why uh, they live by their nose is they have big olfactory uh, lobes. And so basically those bottom lobes on the bottom of that bear's brain is the olfactory lobes and that's why their sense of smell is so good. Also, they use their claws, they have long claws for digging and we'll show some of the pictures in terms of some of the reasons those long claws come into um, effect. So we're gonna talk again about new technology and techniques. We're gonna talk about habitat, capturing of bears, drugging and handling bears, releasing bears, monitoring, remote cameras, DNA, and management tools and prevention. And if you recognize, that's the Chinese wall and the Bob Marshall, and I put grizzly bear tracks going up in that. <laughs> So we're gonna start off with habitat. And I mentioned Chuck Jonkel earlier, and if you ever listen to Chuck Jonkel talk, all he would say is habitat, habitat, habitat. And if bears don't have habitat, um, you know, they don't have a place to live. And the habitat in Northwest Montana is very complex, very diverse because of the topography, the, the moisture, the weather that we have, the vegetation. And also it's a fire regime. Uh, fire ecosystem in Northwest Montana. And a lot of the foods that bears depend on, primarily a lot of the berry plants that bears depend on are uh, fire dependent. So when I started actually in 1982, mapping grizzly bear habitat, we did component mapping. And um, I worked for the US Forest Service. And basically we had a list of different habitat types and the components that we would go out with an aerial photo on the ground, hike into the avalanche chutes and delineate the edges of those. And huckleberry shrub fields, mixed shrub field snow chutes, alder shrub fields that we'd walk through. And that was how we started mapping grizzly bear habitat. And, you know, it was very tedious, took a lot of time. And um, as the research project started uh, gearing up, uh, like I said, the cabinet project in 84, South Fork Grizzly project started up in 87, or 1987, 88. Um, basically, we started getting more information by radio tracking the bears. And there was ground radio tracking. There was radio tracking, that's Dave Horner in the plane. If you know Dave from Red Eagle Aviation, probably flown over a thousand hours with Dave in the plane. Uh, I get air sick, so it was a little tough getting over it, but he was a good pilot and put up with me. And then we've more recently been using helicopters and Jim Bob Pierce, if you know Jim Bob, uh, he took over Red Eagle Aviation and we had the contract with him. And I wanna show you a little bit difference in terms of what it's like radio tracking in different types of situations. But what was nice is being able to radio track and follow radio collared bears, we could get specific locations of where they were, the habitat they were using. And so after the bears left, we would go in on the ground, especially in the South Fork Grizzly Project, and we would go in and identify the plants they were feeding on, like cow parsnip on the left, digging glacier lily bulbs in the middle, glacier lily corms in the middle, and feeding on, say, on buffalo berry. We'd do plots in there, we'd gather the foods, the scats, and we learned a lot about what bears fed on and what they were doing. And uh, I really enjoyed that because we were out in the field every, every day, basically going into where bears had actually been and uh, seeing exactly what they were up to. The other neat thing is we got to examine grizzly bear dens. And uh, um, they den in some really unique places, usually high elevation above 6,000 feet. And so climbing into a bear den is really interesting. But we go in in the summer because when we go in the summer, we basically don't want to run into uh, a bear inside the den. But a room with a view. This is up on the garden wall actually, looking over kind of towards Grinnell and uh, from inside a grizzly bear den. And most of the grizzly bear dens are excavated, usually above 6,000 feet, steep slopes where they can dig into the soil on the side of the hill. And uh, we find them on most, most aspects, but usually there's good deep snow cover where they're at. And so 
When I was working on the South Fork Grizzly Bear Project, we were looking at different ways to map habitat in a large area. And, you know, 9 million acre, the NCDE, Northern Continental Divide Ecosystem. So we started uh, working with the Forest Service and we, they got some Landsat satellite imagery and we were able to go in and uh, do some transformation of that and come up with a way to, to map grizzly bear habitat based on brightness, greenness, and wetness. And we could put bear locations on top of that to see what they tended to prefer. And that was a way that we could start mapping habitat on a large scale and it worked out pretty well. An interesting project that looked at habitat use that hadn't been looked at um, much in Glacier Park. There were some previous studies by uh, White was his last name that did it. But basically, um, Eric Peterson is do, did his graduate work on looking, on grizzly, looking at grizzly bears feeding on army cutworm moss. And so I've got a little video, video footage from Eric Peterson's work to show you what was involved with that. Army cutworm moths migrate from the Great Plains to select high elevation mountains of Glacier National Park in early July, where they aggregate in talus slopes in great numbers. The moths are active at night, feeding in alpine areas to accumulate tremendous factor birds. So much so that by day, grizzly bears are attracted to these lofty summits where the caloric feast that's available to them by digging through the talus and consuming thousands of aggregating moths resting below the surface. Kind of a neat project. And, uh, you know, basically there's some very uh, interesting areas in Glacier National Park and other places down on the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribal uh, lands where bears are up feeding on uh, these army cutworm moths. And so basically from his research, hopefully they're able to go in and actually map some of these areas out so they can understand where the bears are spending their time. This is up on Sai. And then also using uh, grizzly bear habitat uh, movements, also using GIS, Sarah Sells um, is down now working at the co-op unit and uh, Cecily Costello and some other people, they put together maps through using GIS and bear, man, bear movements to basically look at potential movement corridors between the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, the Bitterroots, and the Cabinet Yak. And so some really interesting um, work using computers and GIS and bear movements to try to look at ways that bears might be um, able to move between these different ecosystems. So that's Justine, <laughs> not the bear. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about capturing grizzly bears. And, and our techniques have changed over the years. We've learned a lot. This is the first grizzly that I caught and handled. It was in the cabinets in 85. He's a little younger at that time. Um, it was a 27 year old male grizzly. We trapped for like five years in the cabinets and uh, we caught three grizzlies and I don't know, a couple hundred black bears, I think. But um, uh, this was a 27 year old male, that first bear that I ever caught. And I haven't really kept track, but I know it's over 600 captures on grizzlies that I've had since that time. So um, learned a lot over the years. So how do you catch bears? Well, you can free range them. Um, I've free ranged a few bears. Luckily, I'm not like the guy on the right. I think that's up in Finland or somewhere like that where you've got a dart in the bear and the bear's chasing them. I've never had that happen, but that's definitely a potential. Um, so what's traditionally has been used is uh, leg hold snares, Aldrich leg hold foot snares which are basically quarter, airline, quarter inch airline cable attached, the other end is attached to a tree. And these are log cubbies that we basically build that put bait in the back. And when the bear goes in to, to get to the bait, they step on a spring that pulls back and pulls that snare tight around their, around their um, leg, their front leg usually. That's what it looks like, a bear caught in a snare. And then we you know, use a dart gun or jabs pole um, 
to drug the bear and then work it up. And most of the snaring is done with research. Um, I was involved mostly with management, and so we ended up um, using culvert traps. But when you are using foot snares, one thing you need to be aware of is how where the bear can reach and how far they can come. And so you want to make sure when you're walking up how well they're caught, and you want to make sure that you know how where they can reach before you get too close to them. And that's darting a bear in the snare. I think it's kind of hard on the bears, and so we've actually tried to reduce the amount of snaring that we are doing, especially with management situations. So then we have culvert traps. Those are another option. And the culvert traps are called culvert traps because they're basically made out of culverts. That's what they used early on, and they had uh, gravel, they had metal grates on the front of them, and um, that the way they were built, they had the potential that actually you get teeth could get broken or claws could get broken, and so we've modified them over the years to make them more uh, easier easier for the bears, I guess you could say, in terms of if they are fighting in the culvert trap, they're not going to injure themselves or have less potential to injure themselves. They tend to calm down pretty easily. We had steel traps built. We had aluminum traps built that could also be uh, lifted by helicopter or could be taken off the trailers and moved. Uh, this is a family trap. We shared that with Glacier National Park. I'll talk a little bit about the reason for having a family trap. And this is the automated bear trap. It's the only one in the world. It needs some work. I'll talk a little bit more about the, the automated bear trap, but it's very, very unique in terms of how it was designed and how we used it. So the single uh, bear traps are about eight feet long, which I think they're too short. They need to be more like 10 feet long because we've had bears reach in and get the bait without and having the door come down and the bears still be able to back out of it. Um, they work great, easy to move around, set up. We usually put straw on the bottom of them. And then um, the one problem is if you catch, if you have a family group and you catch mom and the cubs are there, you've got to catch the cubs, right? And so that's why we have the family trap. And the family trap is about 14 feet long. It's divided into two sections. And so the idea is you catch mom first, put her in the front of the family trap, and then you catch the cubs when they go in to be with mom. So that's the idea. So here's a little video I put together showing basically what it's like trying to catch a family group. And so we caught mom in the, in the automated bear trap. Then we had to go get the family trap to bring it down because we needed to catch the cubs. We took that down and set it up where we put drug the female and she's in front of the family trap on the left and then set it up for the two yearlings to come in. And the idea is to get the yearlings to go into the traps and get caught. And so we use a little bait, roadkill deer for, ch for bait, for chum. And it's kind of a waiting game. Well, that one's going into the family trap where the mother is. And this one's going into the family trap or the automated bear trap where we had caught the mother in originally. And the remote camera quit working because they'd gone into the trap, but we did catch both of them. So we caught everybody. This is what you don't want to hear when you drive up to your trap. This is a cub caught in the trap bawling for mom and mom's not in the trap. The cub's in the trap. And in this case, you try to set another trap to catch the adult female, or you try to dart the adult female, or you get the uh, uh, cub, if it's in a snare, out of the trap, and in this case, threw it into the truck so we could get away from the female and work the cub up at a different location so we didn't have to worry about mom coming in on us while we were working up the cub. So this is the automated bear trap. Ryan Alter invented it, and um, it's a high-tech trap. And right now, I don't think it's working really well because 
uh, the front door got left open and a bear came and ripped a lot of the cables out of it. And it took a little bit to, f to fix it. But um, basically this trap, when we first used it, he had it set up that we hooked it up to a satellite dish where we had, because we didn't have internet access. So the idea with this trap is the bear goes in, pulls on the bait, the door drops, an email comes to me saying the door is dropped, okay? <laughs> I can, there's a camera inside the trap. I can turn the camera on. I can see what's caught. And if it's a black bear and we're not trapping for black bears, we could push a button from the computer at home, open the door and let the bear out. So that's the automated bear trap. So this is what it looks like. So, you know, bear going in, there's actually a camera also inside. It's always interesting to watch bears when they go into traps. Some are really wary, some just walk right in. So door goes down, bear's caught. I get an email, bear's caught and trapped. Turn on, you know, look, turn on the camera, look. Oh yeah, caught the grizzly bear. We go, we drug it, radio collar it, put it back in the trap, let it recover, and then depending on the location, I can go back home and wait till the bear recovers, get up middle of the night, push the button, open the door and let the bear out, go back to bed. Really came in handy. It really came in handy the night I caught a skunk because then I could just push the door and let the skunk out. Well, I have, we have not caught any cows. Um, and uh, we've caught a few dogs, things like that. We don't use cows for bait. We primarily use vehicle killed deer for bait, and this is Justine in her happy place, <laughs> butchering deer. We pick up a lot of roadkill deer. Okay, so once we have a bear captured, we need to drug them and handle it. And some of you have probably seen this video. Um, the Craigheads down in Yellowstone, they started. Uh, back in the late 50s into 1970, and they developed a lot of the techniques and equipment early on. And we learned a lot about what to do and what not to do based on what they did. And this film that I'm going to show is copyrighted by National Geographic, but it's always interesting for me to go back and look at the film because of um, what they did and, and how we do things now.
That's what we try to avoid. <laughs> so this is more like what it happened when the drugs we use now are different than what they used then. Um, more predictable for us to know how quickly the bear might come out of it. Rachel's checking the eye location on this bear, whether they're forward or whether the bear come out of the drug. This is a um, an adult female grizzly we caught in the North Fork of the Flathead for trend monitoring. And she had two cubs with her. They were up in the tree next to where the bear's at. Um, we have Reggie Altchop is with us and uh, Oliver Meister, if you know uh, Reggie and Oliver from up at Pole Bridge, helping us out. And uh, so basically she, we're all done. We've collared her, we've, we've taken all the measurements, everything we needed to do. And uh, so we set up a remote camera to, to watch her reaction in terms of uh, getting up. She has a face covering on. We put that on to basically uh, keep dirt out of their eye and pine needles and stuff like that. And so the drugs we use are were telazole and metatomidine in this bear. And we can reverse the metatomidine so they come out a little quicker. So I'm just giving her a little shot and the adipamazole, the reversal, grab the face mask off. You know, I pulled up in the truck, and so we can just back out and then get to a good location where we could watch her from a distance and um, make sure that she comes out of the drug okay. There's other bears in the area, so we want to make sure that she's able to get up and move away uh, in case a, another an adult male or another bear comes in uh, while she's still under the effects of the drug. One last check on her and then we move away and then the cubs come down and uh, reunite with her. Of course, they're wanting a nurse on her. They've been up in the tree for a while. Do the drugs have an on uh, No, they're usually metabolized by that time, so don't have any effect on that. So once we do have bears captured, you saw, you know, in terms of the drug and handling there, this is, if we catch them in a culvert trap, we need to uh, anesthetize them. And so we use a syringe pole, we call it a jab stick. It just has a syringe on the end of it uh, to administer the drug, or uh, we can use dart guns also. And then once the bear is drugged, um, pull it out. It's Neil Anderson, who was my supervisor at the time, and then Martha Williams, she was our director, and she's the director of Fish and Wildlife Service now. Um, but it was good to get, you know, some of the administrative folks out with us in the field working. And so some of the things that we, we do is provide supplemental oxygen. That's what's in that green container. Uh, we hook up a pulse oximeter to monitor heart rate and um, uh, oxygen level. That's the pulse oximeter right now. there. We put ophthalmic ointment in the eyes to keep their cornea moist because they lose the ability to blink when they're under the effects of the drug. And then we are also getting a, a body mass uh, index to figure out uh, fat level. And we used to use a, um, uh, ear tags a lot for marking bears. I went to starting to use uh, microchips back in 96. We would inject the microchip at the same spot and then that way uh, we could um, identify the bear if we captured it again. Ear tags, some people are still ear tagging. Um, I got away from it because ear tags would rip out or you could get infection in the ears. And the bottom is, you know, it's a nine digit number that we get, each one's unique. Similar to getting your pet microchip, your cat, dogs, horses. We also, in the upper right corner, we use cotton spacers. Uh, and that is so that if a release mechanism fails on the collar, the collar will eventually fall off so the bear doesn't wear a collar. 
the rest of its life. And you can see at the bottom, uh, call it its drop. Draw blood. Uh, for DNA, we can uh, also send it down to the lab. Take temperature, monitor temperature, so bears don't overheat. They don't have the ability to um, regulate their body temperature when they're under the effects of the drug. So we have water nearby. Keep them in the shade, keep them cool, or if it's cold out, also uh, keep them so they uh, cover them up so they don't get too cold. And also check their teeth for age. Um, we've been pro pulling the premolar right behind the canine to get the uh, count the rings in the root of the tree uh, of the tooth. And so it's like just counting like the rings of a tree, you know, in terms of the age. And then get a weight on them. We had got this digital scale um, that was uh, donated to us through a fundraiser that occurred. And uh, that way we didn't have to lift them up on a, uh, with a fence post and a, you know, scale and trying to lift big bears is really difficult. Really turns out nice. Take body measurements. We check on females for lactation or whether they're an estrus. This is uh, uh, getting milk out of a female, so we knew she had cubs. And then also pulling hair for DNA so we could identify individuals. And then when we're done with that, we put them back in the trap and let them recover. And it's a, usually a nice slow recovery in the culvert trap. Um, we can provide water for them if, if need be and put them on a bed of hay also in there. In some cases, we've had situations where bears were injured. We could tell they had been injured. We didn't know what the injury was. Um, in the case on the left-hand side, that bear had been shot. Uh, somebody had shot it in the leg and uh, took it to the vet clinic, had it x-rayed. Um, same thing, similar with the bear on the right. These are x-rays from Ashley, Ashley Creek Animal Clinic. Actually, we took the bears in, and this bear in, and we saw, you can see the bullet fragments um, where it had been shot in the leg, and also those little white pellets. That's uh, BBs from shotgun. Some people think you can pepper bears with shotgun pellets, and uh, that's not a good thing. It's illegal to do it, for one thing, but um, we've had bears severely injured by people that have peppered them with birdshot. This is a unique situation. We had a grizzly actually over in the Ferndale area. She had a cub with her in the fall, and a grouse hunter encountered her, shot her at close range with a 16-gauge shotgun filled with bird pellets. And uh, we ended up capturing her and the cub and got a hold of Dr. Uh, Dan Savage most of you probably know, a veterinarian, and had him take a look at her to see whether he thought he could remove the eye and if there was any other damage to her. And uh, we decided to go ahead and do that. He removed the eye and uh, we reunited her back with her cub. We actually released her up in the Spotted Bear River area. Um, so veterinarians have come in very handy in terms of helping us uh, whether we had to do x-rays or do any kind of surgeries, which is very rare on bears or even had to, if we've had to euthanize them. So releasing bears. Uh, the decision is made to release a bear back into the wild. I um, wanted to show you kind of some ways to do that safely. And uh, there's other ways that were, have been done in the past that weren't that safe. And the example everybody might be aware of is 1987, a Lou Kiss, warden captain, was releasing a grizzly bear caught on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, and uh, had some photographers and writers with him, and he got on the trap and lifted the door to let this adult male grizzly bear out. And uh, the trap wasn't anchored in the truck at all. Uh, the bear reached up, pulled the trap off with Lou, injured Lou, of course. Lou was lucky, was able to get his pistol out and shoot, and actually ended up killing the bear. Yeah, but uh, he ended up injured and the bear ended up dead. And so that changed some of the protocol in terms of how grizzly bears were released. And so now we use winches, ropes, things like that, safety of the vehicles, um, so that uh, you know big adult males like this, um, or big adult females, especially everybody's in a good safe location when we release. Um, 
I know you can't read this. That's a typical, you can't read this, but um, we do coordinate with the Forest Service and uh, DNRC um, state lands and private landowners on where we release bears. We're going to release them. So we go through a process to identify release sites. A lot of people think we kick bears loose in the, in the Bob Marshall in the wilderness area, but we don't. Um, and the reason we, we had approved release sites in the wilderness, but they frown on helicopter use in the wilderness areas, which I understand that. The other thing is it's expensive to use helicopters to move a bear. And if you drop a bear off at Big Prairie, it can walk out in a day back into the Swan Valley. And all of a sudden, you know, why not just drive it up Spotted Bear River Road, kick it loose rather than, than you know, bringing in a helicopter. So um, these are um, just to show you that we have gone through a process with the Forest Service to try to figure out where good release sites were. So this is what we call a soft release. Now this is a female with a couple of young cubs. We just open the door, let her out, and uh, they get back together and move on. No yelling, no barking dogs, no bean backgrounds, you know, just an easy, quiet, soft release. She comes out, and the cubs come out, and they do get reunited. And then there's what we call a hard release, bean backgrounds, rubber bullets, Cracker shells, barking curly and bear dogs, we did those. See what worked, what didn't. We're on the ground here because this is a sub-adult, two-year-old female. We felt comfortable with her. We had the bear dogs in front of us and, you know, a lot of noise and yelling. And she does what typically happens with most bear releases is she just takes off. All bears are individuals, and you'll see different bunch of releases here. Like I said, all bears are individuals, so you get all different kinds of releases. That's the way most of them usually go. We very rarely have them chase the truck. This bear, we knew he was gonna be a problem, and we never even drugged him, and he was aggressive in the trap. So we just, we unhooked the trap, and I hooked up a rope 100 feet away in my truck, and I just pulled the door up, and, uh, as soon as he came out, I opened my door a crack, dropped the door, and we were able to drive off. Here's another view of the same bear. Luckily, he didn't bite the tire. I've had him bite the tire before. Yeah, one little swat, and there he goes. So what we did here is we just backed the truck up, grabbed the cameras we had set up, and we left the trap set, and we came back the next day. We gave him a chance to clear out of the area. You know, why mess around? There's a reason this, this is the automated bear trap. Like I said, I can, re, you know, open it from the house. I could, and this photographer wanted to, See what happened if he set his camera up on a tripod. <laughs> Luckily, the camera didn't get damaged. But again, you know, we evaluate each of the bears and whether or not, you know, what's going to be safe. And um, we, we do everything in a safe manner as we can. So monitoring. So once bears are on the ground, how do we keep track of them? Well, this is how they did it down in Yellowstone with the Craigheads. You can see they had big antennas. See how big the collars were on the bears. Um, you know, they were learning, trying to figure out what worked, what didn't work. That was in 1962. Our antennas are a lot smaller now. And uh, here's Justine out ground tracking, actually picking up collars and radio tracking bears. And then we started doing a lot of flying. When I worked on the South Fork Grizzly Project, I did a lot of the flying. We fly twice a week. Like I said, I probably put in over a thousand hours with Dave Corner flying. And uh, 
just wanted to give you an idea of what it's like radio tracking from a plane. So the antenna, you can see the little red knobs on the end of the antenna. Look right off the end of that knob. You see that looks like a mine tailing almost. Okay, that's a grizzly bear den. And so with planes, you're not able to get right down close. And so I zoomed in here just to show you that's the den. And then what I'm going to do is actually do another flyby on a different bear and see how good you guys are at spotting the bear. Okay, you ready? Did you hear me? I said, oh, there she is. I got her. There she is, right there. Did you guys spot him? Here, I'll blow it up. There it is, female with her two cubs. So flying by in a, in a fixed wing can be a little difficult to get the spottings, but we would see them about 30% of the time, okay? We also had the opportunity to work with Two Bear Air Rescue. You've probably heard about them. And um, they have this great camera system at the bottom of the helicopter, and it's got a great zoom on it, and it's got infrared. And so I wanted to show you the difference from flying by in a fixed wing versus radio tracking in a helicopter. And one of the things the trend monitoring folks want to do is um, look at number of females with uh, cubs, number of cubs with the different females when they come out of the den. This female in the Jewel Basin area, she just had one cub and she just decided to carry it. This is uh, on the South Fork of the Flathead uh, drainage and female with two cubs of the year. And then again, this is from the Two Bear Air helicopter. So you can see the difference, the advantage of having something like that, being able to um, record everything. This is all being recorded from their camera as the locations and everything. And this is in the Mission Mountains. This is a female. Um, she has three cubs of the year. She's a trend monitoring bear. And everybody's like, well, you're really, really close. Well, the advantage to having this camera system You'll see when we zoom out how far away we actually are. Yeah, so big advantage. The other advantage is it had infrared capability. And so for search and rescue, they're looking for people that are lost in the woods. In this case, the heat signature is given off by the bears. You can see the tracks even in the, in the, on the ground from the heat signature. And if we switch from infrared to daylight camera, you can see the difference. So we are very fortunate to be able to use uh, the resources of Two Bear Air Rescue. The other neat thing was for dens. I put this in here because there's a grizzly bear den. This is up in uh, teepee drainage up in the North Fork of the Flathead. And we knew that this grizzly bear, she had a couple of cubs with her, and we wanted to see if she still had them. So daylight's on the left, infrared's on the right, and you can actually see inside the den. And if you zoom in even more, you can see the bear's ears in there, and we know at least that she has, still has one of her cubs with her. So kind of neat technology. The other thing that was advanced is in the earlier years, the, the collars that we have were uh, VHF. And so you basically had to have an antenna. And to get the radio signal, you had to have a receiver, the antenna. And you had to basically turn the antenna around or in the airplane getting close to get a location. Same with the helicopter. Well, GPS collars came out. And the first ones we started using were called Argos GPS. And basically, it would store the data on the collar, but it allowed us to get a lot of information um, precise information 24 hours a day on the bears. And in this case, to get a location, I think every four hours we programmed the, these. And so Lori Roberts actually put together this map of a bear we called Ethel. And you might have heard of Ethel. She's a bear that I caught over by Lake Blaine, <coughs> excuse me, and we moved her up to near Mariah's Pass and released her. And these are her travels basically over two years. 
about 2,800 miles. She basically went, um, let's see if I can get it over on this screen, caught her here, released her up here. She went down the Rocky Mountain th front through the Bob Marshall, uh, South Fork drainage down here towards Missoula. And she went over into Idaho. She eventually went down all the way to about Florence, turned around, backtracked, went back all through this area, went up through Glacier Park, right through here, and dropped her radio collar right up here outside of Eureka. And we picked the collar up. And she was basically lost, is what it was. But it was very interesting because if we had just had a regular VH collar on her, we'd have probably gotten four or five locations off of her rather than all of these locations that actually looked at where she went. Another bear you've probably heard about is a bear we call the lakeside female. We captured her in 2010. She was a two-year-old bear. We caught her um, on the uh, west side of Flathead Lake by lakeside. We had a report of a bear getting into chickens. And we set a trap, caught her. And since we caught her on that side, we released her up towards Blacktail. And we did a hard release on her. And she dropped her collar in 2011 over on the other side of Hunk, uh, Flathead Lake, over by Swan Lake. And so it's like, okay, well, how'd she get there? Well, having the Argos GPS collar on her, we got all these locations, and you can see that she's the bear that swam across Flathead Lake. And this is how she went, is basically she swam out to Wild Horse Island, spent a little time on Wild Horse, went down, swam south to King's Point, crossed over to Bird Island, and then over to the east side of the lake. And that took five days that she did it. She didn't do it all at one time. But without the GPS collar, we wouldn't have had any idea how she uh, got from the west side of Flathead Lake over to the east side. So these are the collars that are, we're using uh, currently. They're on the Iridium uh, platform, GPS radio collar. The data can be downloaded to the computer every other day. Uh, we can get locations uh, for whatever we set, whether we want six hour locations, our location every four hours, or location every half hour. And we have two way communication with the caller, so we can actually trigger it to drop off, which is really nice. And we have geofence capability. And everybody's like, well, what's a geofence? Well, I'll show you what a geofence is. So this is Northwest Montana. And what I did is I built a geofence in Google Earth. And so essentially, I was able to go in and build these polygons. This is, and what I wanted to do was, this is for management bears primarily, bears that were in conflict with people, is these shaded areas basically encompass all those places where people live. So this is the North Fork of the Flathead. So we've got Eureka down to Stryker, and then we do the Middle Fork up to Mariah's Pass, and then we do the Flathead Valley, and the Swan Valley. And then we went ahead and finished up with uh, the mission area. And so by doing this, I wanted to know when a bear was in that shaded area within the geofence, I wanted more locations on the bear. So I set it to get a location every half hour. So I could see exactly kind of what the bear was doing, where it was going. And when it was in the middle of the Bob Marshall or in the middle of Glacier Park, I didn't really care. So I had it set for a location every six hours. Okay, so you save battery life. You still get locations on them when they're outside the geofence. But when they're inside the geofence where people are living, again, these are management bears we're concerned about what they're doing, you get more locations and more information. So here's an example of this two-year-old female that we released up near Marias Pass. She's in the middle fork, so she's getting a location every half hour. She crosses the Great Bear Wilderness. Hunger Horse Reservoir gets a location every six hours here, rolls into the Flathead Valley, and we get a location every half hour while she's in the Flathead Valley along the Flathead River. She comes down here, crosses right on the North Shore, Flathead Lake, comes through Big Fork in the middle of the night, comes through Ferndale area, and goes up and dens up on the Swan Crest. So that's the advantage of having the GPS collars and the geofence to be able to get additional information. Here's another bear that we caught down here by Columbia Falls by the compost uh, 
uh, plant or compost location and basically released her up here near Upper Whitefish Lake. And over the course of two weeks, she went over the top of the Whitefish Divide or Whitefish Range and ended up in the North Fork of the Flathead, almost uh, uh, down the Camas Road, turned around, went back up the North Fork, over the top, crossed Highway 93, came over around Tally Lake, came right down here and right along Whitefish Lake. And if we zoom in, again, you can look at every half hour locations basically to see where she was traveling um, at half hour increments. Another interesting thing or nice thing about having the GPS callers is we can look at their locations relative to other places. So this is the Forest Service rental cabins, Ben Rover, Ford, Wirtz, all up in the North Fork and Schnauss. All these red dots are grizzly bear GPS locations off of one male grizzly that we had collared up there. And so that's why we tell people when you rent these cabins, you can't leave food out on the decks on the porch is because there are bears around, even though you may not see them, they're there. Here's flying, if we flew Martin City, this is one radio collared bears location, so those red dots, quorum. You can see all through that area, bears very rarely are seen, but they can be around quite a bit, and they cover a lot of ground. And a really good example I like is if we zoom in to Condon, in the Swan Valley to the community center where Eric Wenham, they're going to have a uh, spring wake up social there, um, April 3rd, I believe it is. And if we zoom back out and we put a five mile radius around that area, and then we put all the female GPS grizzly bear radio locations from research and management bears, and then we put all the male GPS grizzly bear locations, and then when we put them both on there, you can see why people that live in the swan or places where grizzly bears live need to make sure they don't leave their garbage out, their bird feeders out, because the bears are there. And that's why they have bring bear wake up socials and bear fairs, not just at Condon, but that's where it started. And we've expanded it. They've done them in Eureka. They've done them uh, in, up at Pole Bridge and up at Essex also and Quorum area, West Glacier. And so, you know, these GPS locations give us a lot of information. Also, the GPS callers allow us to find bears that have been killed illegally, like this young female shot near Beaver Lake. And uh, basically, we would not have found this bear without the GPS caller on her. Somebody shot her, didn't report it, we went in and found her. Remote cameras, I'll touch on these briefly. Um, everybody's heard about trail cameras. I actually built some of the first uh, trail cameras in 1985 that uh, we used um, eventually on the South Fork Grizzly Bear Project. Those are the top, bottom two cameras we're working on population estimates. I used them up at the uh, train derailments up there at, uh, um, in the middle fork of the Flathead when they had all the corn spills and whatnot. And this is what it was. Basically, it was... Uh, uh, Olympus 35 millimeter camera that would shoot 36 exposure roll of film, remember film days, and hooked up to a burglar alarm that I got from Radio Shack, and basically put inside a 50 caliber ammo can and made them, and we started getting photos, and we tried to come up with population estimates using the cameras. Well, my wife says you should have patented that. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah but I didn't. And now we have digital cameras that shoot video. And so, you know, homeowners can have it out. Uh, we get a bear that gets into somebody's camp trailer or something. We can set cameras up to document what bears might be breaking into certain things. So it's really come, you know, advanced a long way in terms of uh, the capability of the trail cameras. And a lot of people have them. DNA. As I mentioned before, uh, Kate Kendall uh, basically headed up the DNA programs that we used um, for a population estimate. And since then, we've expanded upon that. Um, for that, they were using the hair follicles from, from 
when bears would go under the barbed wire fence into the hair corrals essentially. But since then, you know, we use tissue, blood, sal saliva, and even scat to get DNA from bears to identify um, individuals, sex of the bears, they're doing parentage with it, uh, family trees, identify management bears at conflict sites, and identify bears that are involved in either livestock or human attacks. And so when Kate was doing it and her team of folks, um, we helped with some of that. And I don't have a picture of what they were doing in terms of some of the uh, lure making, but this is what we were doing in some of the lure making. Basically, it's fish oil and blood and really stinky stuff. And basically, you would go and uh, set up these uh, corrals uh, with barbed wire and put sticks and logs in the middle on the ground, pour that stinky stuff over it. Uh, you may hang some film canisters with some other attractants, anise oil or whatever. And, it, and the idea is to get a bear to go in under the barbed wire and you collect the hair and you get the DNA from the hair follicle. And they also use rub trees for that. And uh, um, in this case, um, we still have landowners that have rub trees on their property. Alan Chrisman, he's in here. He's up the North Fork of the Flathead. And this is uh, rub trees on their property up there. And he collects the hair and gives it to us. And we can uh, get DNA to identify what bears are there. And there's t a lot of really interesting remote camera video of grizzly bears at rub trees. And the Swan Valley Connections, Luke Lamar and his folks have put together this little video of this particular bear. And I've included it um, just because this bear covers all aspects of getting everything rubbed. <laughs> and I know Kate Kendall's got some great footage, you know, that people have put the music and all that stuff. But and it, in terms of this bear, Spends a lot of time there. He's actually a marked bear. He was a bear caught for trend. He's got a green ear tag in his ear. Um, no radio collar on him. And unfortunately, this bear was hit and killed on the Swan Highway the next year after this occurred. But again, um, some great video footage, and you'll, you'll see as it continues here. And if you're out hiking, it's really easy, actually, if you pay attention to find these bear rub trees. They're really noticeable. So if you're hiking a trail, you know, look for, they're basically, you can see where they're kind of rubbed smooth on the side. Sometimes you'll find footprints at the base of them. This bear's really getting into it. Get that side taken care of. Got to get the other side done now. And the back side. Got to get it all. Anyway, I just thought that was a fun video. If you go to their website, they got a, a lot of video footage of bears and rub trees and wolves and wolverine and all kinds of links, all kinds of stuff. And you probably have seen this. This was very popular, even showed up on the news. But um, Kevin Burns, who works for uh, the Gogans, this is their property over on the east front. And he had to, he sent me the video footage of this bear. And it's basically a building instead of a rub tree, but basically doing the same thing. And he did collect hair off of it and gave it to the biologist so we know what bear it was. But if you came there, you'd think the bear was trying to rip into the shed and stuff. And now, see, all it was doing was rubbing on it. So management tools and prevention. This is my Carillion bear dog, Tess. I got her in 1995. And we were trying to look at different ways to work bears with aversive conditioning using Carillion bear dogs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through it. But this is where most of my work involved was working with people that were living in bear country. And basically the goal was to keep people safe, minimize property damage, and keep bears from getting into conflict with people. And so we had a lot of, you know, several objectives, basically to try to minimize, we weren't gonna eliminate, but we could minimize 
conflicts by working with landowners to identify and secure their attractants, such as garbage, chickens, fruit trees. Also working with the agencies on food storage orders. Um, you know, they got in, uh, in the campgrounds, they got in these bare food, bare food storage boxes, um, electric fences around outfitter cook tents. And that top picture of all the garbage, that's how some campers leave their places, unfortunately. And Rachel worked uh, as a technician for the Forest Service and spent a lot of time. She felt she was a janitor picking up uh, garbage people left in their fire rings or just left on the ground. Also worked with city, county, state, federal governments to prevent grizzly bear conflicts. And Flathead County has been really good. So has Lincoln County in terms of bear proofing and putting electric fence around the container sites. This is the one over at Quorum. It was one of the first ones we did in Flathead County. Tom Esch was very uh, helpful in uh, getting us, helping us get money and getting bear resistant containers in at Essex back in 93, 94. And we had um, you know, bear problems up there. So you know, a lot of money, time and effort went into this, but since these sites have been electrified, we haven't been having bears get into them. So it's been very effective. Also spend time working with the media to try to get out uh, information, correct information. I had to put this in because I have Daryl Hannah sitting in the, my truck with me. She did a TBS special. We did a lot of work with Jack Hanna. Um, he was a big part of our fundraising efforts. And then um, 60 Minutes came, Bill Whitaker. And unfortunately, we were up on Alan Christman's property and um, uh, I didn't make it off the cutting room floor but we still did the interview. And also to work with the public on how to, to live and recreate uh, safely in bear country. Work a lot with landowners, uh, the public, nonprofit organizations and agency personnel. Um, and um, Chuck Cameron, Rachel and Gary Moses were all rangers in Glacier Park on bear teams. They're all retired. Uh, Anders uh, Roast, he basically was attacked by a grizzly bear over in the Haskell Basin area. And so uh, we invited him to come help us work up a grizzly bear so that he could basically could get his hands on a bear. And, and uh, um, you know, he had a very traumatic experience. Luckily, he wasn't injured that badly, but it was a, a pretty, you know, uh, difficult ordeal for him. And also respond to grizzly bear conflicts on private and public lands. This is the family group up the North Fork, broke into this camp trailer, unoccupied camp trailer. That's the adult female. She had three yearlings with her. Because of what they were doing, we ended up removing the whole family group. Um, there's just not the tolerance for bears breaking into structures. Because if they start doing that, they're going to continue to do it. Food storage order down here. That's why the Forest Service is asking people to hang their game that they harvest out of reach of bears. This young hunter, first deer bear came in and basically shredded it down the swan because he didn't get it up high enough. Fruit trees. A lot of fruit trees in the Flathead Valley, and it's hard to keep bears from getting in the fruit trees. Some of the things we've tried doing is Justine started the Flathead Fruit Gleaning Facebook page to connect people that have fruit with people that want to pick fruit. Uh, it's been going for several years now and, and it's getting more popular. And actually they started doing it down on the uh, Flathead Indian Reservation also. And then also started the Flathead Bearware page on Facebook where people could come on and get uh, information about uh, living in bear country, how to build electric fences, that kind of stuff. And you know, over 5,000 likes and followers. So it's again, something that I think there's a lot of interest in it. In Montana, it's illegal to knowingly feed wildlife. That's deer, elk, moose, black bears, grizzly bears, and mountain lions, but it continues to be an F issue. And so that's why we continue educational stuff to work with people to let them know that you're uh, basically creating a dangerous situation for yourself and also for the bears. So how do you keep bears out of uh, places where you don't want them? One of the most effective besides removing the attractant 
is electric fencing, electric fence energizers. And there's a lot of information that we have if you go to the websites uh, on how to build an effective electric fence and maintain it. Uh, this is down the swan. We put electric fence around this chicken coop and you see it not just deters grizzly bears, but also black bears, fox, raccoons, and skunks. Everything likes chickens. And people wonder, well, is it effective? Well, here's a young female grizzly bear that had gotten into a chicken coop over in Ferndale area. So I basically took and put field fence on the door, wooden door, hooked it up to an energizer. And when she stopped on it, or uh, stuck her nose on it, she got shocked. Here's another one where uh, this bear had broken into a chicken coop to a window. We replaced it with a screen, and it got shocked. This is a family group of grizzly bears that had broken in uh, near Star Meadows, uh, pushed in a door to get horse feed and dog food. Um, this is what the door looked like. What we did is we put a screen on the ground, grounded that, hooked that to the ground wire. The door was metal, so with a metal door, we could make the door hot, hook the, the hot wire to that. And so when she came back the next night with her two yearlings, you can hear the energizer snapping. She touches the door and gets shocked. And then we also tested out mats. So that mat right there is electrified. That's a cooler out, or a freezer out in somebody's carport. And so Derek and Heather, who used to work with us, they basically were working out of uh, Lake Tahoe area, and they developed the, um, these mats that are unwelcome mats, essentially, that if <laughs> bear, because they get a lot of houses broken into down there. And so basically, um, they built these mats and sell them, hooked up to an electric fence energizer, and if, if a bear steps on them, they get shocked. You can walk on it with your shoes and not get shocked. If you're barefoot, you're going to get shocked. And then the Blackfeet Challenge down out of uh, Ovando area, they also tested them and built them for uh, livestock yards. And then up in uh, Canada, uh, the railroad is looking at testing electric fencing and mats um, to keep bears off the railroad tracks. Because like down here, we've had a lot of uh, several grizzly bears hit and killed on the railroad tracks because of corn that gets built on the tracks. I'm going to put this in because this was came from Tim Thier, who's here. He had an idea to keep his dogs from eating his deer uh, when that he harvested in his and hanging, hanging in his garage. So he electrified his deer carcass. So we did it to see if we could keep a grizzly bear off a deer carcass in the woods. And so this is what happened. So we had a roadkill deer. And the idea is, if you're a hunter and you harvest a deer or an elk and you can't get it out of reach of a bear, and you do something to keep a bear from getting it. And basically, we electrified this deer by running a hot wire up and into the, the muscle, the meat of the deer. This bear came back at night. You can see the fence energized blinking green right here. Energizer is blinking green. But what's really interesting is he's going to get shocked again. That's twice. It's pretty hard to pass up a deer hanging there, right? OK. But watching the behavior of this bear, he's only been shocked twice. This is coming on the next morning. Very wary of it. Now what happens here is he steps on the battery and he shuts down the system because he knocks the cables off. So even though there's no power now, he's still very cautious. He moves back and forth. When the deer moves towards him, he moves back. <laughs> the 
He doesn't want to touch it. Finally, he gets up enough nerve. It's been 13 hours now since he's been trying this. The power's out. There's no shock. Finally grabs it, breaks our energizer, and gets the deer. And again, all we are trying to do find out is whether or not you could keep a bear from getting a hanging carcass. And we do know some hunters that have actually harvested deer, um, taken it to their cabins in the Swan Valley and have used this technique to keep bears from getting into it. Curling bear dogs, I won't go deep into this, but we, from 95 to 2000, we contracted with Wind River Bear Institute had the Krillian bear dogs, we did most of our work up the North Fork of the Flathead. We had six radio collared grizzly bears up there. We were monitoring and following. Krillian bear dogs came from Finland and Russia, where they use them to hunt uh, bears there, brown bears. And we use them basically to try to, uh, as a tool to push bears away from places where we don't want them to be. And we worked in Glacier National Park, um, up at Logan Pass, roadside bears, over at Mini Glacier, bears along the Camas Road, and then again, like I said, up the North Fork of the Flathead quite a bit. Uh, we got the dogs used to being around bears, so bears that were drugged, they were quiet around them. And if we needed them to push off bears, we could do it most of the time on leash. Occasionally, we'd kick them loose and let them push a bear hard. We never had any of our dogs injured. This is interesting. This is a bear near a rabbit pen, and the rabbit scared it. Did you see that? <laughs> so Rachel and I have a rabbit, and we think, we wonder if we can rent her out as a deterrent. I need to, Justine has a rabbit too, Justine, you know? So in all seriousness, I wanted to show you what, you know, it's like, what can you do? What can we do to minimize conflicts and stuff? Here's whitefish. These are all grizzly bear locations of captures um, since 1993 through 2019. I don't have any of the more updated ones on here, but we've had more captures around this area since then, but quite a few around whitefish. And if we put the locations of management bears around whitefish, each color is a different bear. And this is a five mile radius. And we do a 10 mile radius. You can see a lot of grizzly bear locations on the falls along the face of the swan and around whitefish, whitefish lake. So what can we do? Well, one thing that happened is Eric Wenham was very instrumental in getting whitefish to do a, a uh, ordinance that you couldn't put your garbage out until morning to pick up unless it was in a bear resistant container. The problem was we didn't have good bear resistant containers at that time. Since then, Grizzly Wolf Discovery Center has a bear testing program, a uh, container testing program where they actually use bears that they have in captivity to test these different products to see what work and what don't. Then we would take them into the, some of them into the field, put a leg of a roadkill deer in it and see whether or not a bear could get into it. This bear right here is actually a bear they called named Spirit. She's a bear that I caught in whitefish 20 years ago, and she lives at the Grizzly Wolf Discovery Center. She's one of their best testers. <laughs> so whitefish, last year working with a Republic Service, they basically committed to getting bear-resistant Kodiak cans. And this is a, a video Justine got of a black bear trying to get into a Kodiak can in Whitefish, and this was last October. So it can be effective, and you know we'd like to see it expanded. Um, and Bear Smart Program is something that's being promoted, and I put this in because this is Virginia City. I was sitting in the Pioneer Bar. There was a bear halfway 
in over 55 gallon drums, which were also our garbage cans at the time. That kind of heightened everybody's concern. A grizzly bear in a tourist town like the town of Virginia City could potentially be nightmarish. I have heard stories when we moved in about bears walking down Main Street, getting into the trash can, bears going in for a jump. There were days they had to close the jump down completely because the bears had been going in there so much. That's when, thankfully, people in carnivores stepped in and helped implement some measures that have helped us mitigate some of those issues. Virginia City is in a really unique wildlife corridor that sits between two mountain ranges, the Gravelly Mountain Range to the south and the Tobacco Roots Range to the north. And this community is kind of right in the middle of an expanding grizzly bear population. At first, we implemented small measures that made quite an impact. <laughs> getting bear-proof containers to a lot of businesses and residents in town. The hydraulic lid at the transfer station has been a, a huge measure for us. We haven't seen the bears for a while. I think they have a tremendous memory of where the food sources are. With the help of the county putting the lids on the local dump, that's made a huge difference. I don't think we've had any experience with bears in town that I can remember. But, uh, we've procured all the commercial cans that line Wallet Street and North Main Street in the town of Virginia City. Those cans have been huge. We don't see bears hopping mm -hmm. over our 55 gallon drums that we used to use as garbage cans anymore. They brought us the trash cans. That was a saving grace. That, that was the very first thing that um, happened. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we realized next year we had choke cherry trees all over the place in the campground. And that September, we had the largest bear visitation I have ever seen. And then we started de pruning the trees. <laughs> we had to harvest as much as we could. So that's becoming a ritual every September now. I think one of the biggest things that people in carnivores has done is just educate folks on how this is a corridor for bears. There's just scores of little things that have added up to make a huge impact in our community. All the prevention methods that we have done have truly prevented a conflict with humans and any kind of apex predator here in the campground. We have not had one single conflict. We hope other communities can see what Virginia City has done to reduce their conflicts and how successful it is. This community can be kind of an example for other communities across Grizzly Bear Recovery Zones to find solutions that are effective at reducing conflict so that we can keep people in their property safe and large carnivores like bears wild. Bear conflicts now have been <clears throat> knock on wood nil over the last six years. We're hoping to maintain that trend, obviously. We think that we're moving in the right direction and we hope to be that model bear smart community for others to look at and be able to scale to and be that beacon that says that it can happen. It's the small town that can and hopefully you know, saving bears in the process. So that's the hope for the future of the town of Virginia City. And I'm thinking, you know, Whitefish, Columbia Falls, the area around here could be leaders also. And this lastly is going to be about bear spray, and then we'll be done. Full time for us. We are making tons of noise. We are being very vigilant with our yelling of hay bear. Screaming out, trying to make sure that any animal out there heard us, and we didn't want to mess with it. I heard it first, um, but maybe the other guys have heard it, and I remember stopping to see if I could hear more, and uh, then. I heard a series of curse words from one of my coworkers and um, immediately started to hear action. Crashing was a lot closer. Maybe 35 or 40 yards from us, we saw a saddle grizzly bear um, standing on its on its legs looking uh, towards us. And we could see that she uh, appeared to have a, a couple uh, young with her. We didn't have very much time to collect ourselves or to group together. Um, as soon as we saw her, she was running at us. Her cubs stayed back, kind of, I don't know, maybe 50 yards away from us, and she continued to charge us. Um, she ran up and came, maybe came within, I want to say, 15 yards, um, and then spun around and went back to her cubs. And we were continuing yelling, hey bear, hey bear, it's okay bear, trying to make her feel comfortable at that time. Um, she uh, did not feel comfortable apparently because she <laughs> uh, came back and charged at us. And you could kind of tell as soon as she started running towards us that it was seemingly going to be different. The second time she ran out, she had 
completely different body language. The first time she kind of just seemed frantic and almost just running out of fear and confusion. And then this time you could tell she was focused. She was running with her head close to the ground, her ears back. Um, and she actually, she singled me out from the three of us uh, and, and changed course and then straight at me. All three of us unloaded our bear spray and, uh, and she took two steps into the cloud and made a 90 degree turn and, and ran out of there. Sorry, bear spray. You never know when you're gonna need it. Don't put it in your backpack to go on the outside. <laughs> you don't have time to get out. Know how to get your bear spray out of your holster. Know how to remove the safety. Mm -hmm. It's the scariest thing. See a bear running at you, and you're suddenly fumbling on the side of your pack, trying to get your bear spray out of the, the holster because it's stuck or something. You really want to be well rehearsed. Oh, they told you to use bear spray. We always carry bear spray. I've never had to use it in all the times I've worked on bears, but I always carry it. So the next question is, well, how do you use it? And this is just a very, very quick video uh, by Kerry Gunther down in Yellowstone showing he's a bear ranger down there how to deploy it. And he's using an inert can, <coughs> excuse me, an inert can of bear spray. <coughs> and this is probably one of the best tips is Practice removing the safety. That's some of the things that people that have used it couldn't figure out how to get the safety off. And finally, organizations that can assist landowners in preventing human bear conflicts. There's Bearware Big Fork, Defenders of Wildlife, North Fork Bear Group, People and Carnivores, and Swan Valley Bear Resources. They have people who will come out and help, sometimes put up electric fence, distribute bear resistant garbage containers. And then, of course, there's the agencies that can assist landowners and recreationists, the Blackfeet Tribe, Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribe, Glacier Park, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, Wildlife Services, Forest Service, and Wildlife Services. And that's the end. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. We'll take a couple of questions. It really works best if you raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone to you because we'd love to hear the questions you have. Do we have any questions? Maybe I answered everybody's questions. That would be great. You were too thorough. That would be good. We have a question up front. Here you go. She wondered what the grizzly bear population was now in Northwest Montana. Well, when Kate did it, back in 2004 it was 765 plus or minus within the northern continental divide ecosystem and since then cecily costello rick mace they did the trend monitoring program and the longer you go from that population estimate the less confidence there is in it but we think it's up around 1100 1200 bears in the northern continental divide ecosystem do you have any follow-through on the the other two lost their hide? That's no, unfortunately, we did not have a GPS collar on her. We put on a regular VHF, and we flew a couple of times looking for her, but because she was in the Bob Marshall, we don't have a lot of bears collared in the Bob, and so we didn't spend a lot of time looking for her, but we never did. No reports of her showing back up, no reports of anybody seeing her, killing her or anything. So we assume she probably did okay, but we don't know for sure. Now that you're not working for the government, maybe you can answer what your thoughts are on this question. <laughs> <laughs> I might plead the fifth. <laughs> Tina. Some legislation that passed, and again, I'm sorry, I don't have a lot of details, but my understanding is that it really kind of tied the hands even more on the enforcement side of being able to um, go onto properties where maybe there's suspicion <laughs> of some, you know, um, issues in terms of maybe feeding bears or what have you. And that, um, uh, you know, the bear managers and the wardens would have to have even more evidence to even be able to go and talk to them on, on handling the issue. So do you know, 
uh, your thoughts on well, that? it's always been if a, if property is posted, we have to get prior permission to go on the property, whether it's wardens or whether it's us. A lot of times we would, I would, you know, just to go talk to people, I would still go in and contact people. But yeah, for law enforcement type stuff, they have to have some kind of evidence. And what has actually happened is we've had GPS caller evidence of bears going to this specific place repeatedly. And we've given that to the wardens and they can go in and, you know, then make contact saying, you know, why are all these bears showing up at your house? You know, well, because I've been feeding them dog food or something like that. And so we've been able to do some of that. So the GPS callers help a lot with that. Or if they get reports from the neighbors, but a lot of times the wardens have to be able to observe it in order to have probable cause to go in. Yeah. You're getting your exercise. Are you able to use drones? We've talked about using drones, and in fact, I think Confederated Salish Kootenai Tribe folks, they used drones down there when they had a bear hit on the highway, and they went looking for it that way. Um, the department has some biologists that are starting to use drones, but nothing on grizzly bears at this point. Um, so you have an estimate of 1,100 bears in the northwest area. Mm -hmm. Is there a well, they've been, the department's been looking at what is the minimum number, and basically they don't want it to drop below 800. And so if there is a hunting season or something like that, once they're delisted, they would make sure that, you know, they, they keep tight reins on harvest and mortalities and, um, continue to monitor the population trend. And, but there's no upper limit in terms of, you know, like, well, we need 5,000 bears in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. There's probably some groups that say we need that, but in terms of the department, they're saying we're, we want to maintain at least 800 grizzly bears in the NCDE. All right, it is getting late, okay. so we'll, we'll call it a night. Thank you okay. so much, Tim. Thanks, Thanks you bet. Coming. We'll see you in a month.